Good morning, church. Great to be with you all this morning. The title of today's message is Holding On to Hope. It's great to be with you all. Before we jump into the Word, let's just go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, You truly are great. Father God, You are awesome. Lord God, we just love You so much. You are the one that we love. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And You are the way to the Father, Jesus. And so we want to honor You and praise You here and now. Lord God, may You take Your Word and just unfold it for us here today in a way that we can understand it, in a way that it can enter our hearts, Lord God, and that it can bring forth much fruit, Father God. Some 30, 60, and even 100 fold. Father God, that we're going to see an awesome harvest through the seed of Your Word today. Lord God, because You get me out of Your way and make me Your vessel, Lord God, that Your Word would flow through clean and pure, And Lord God, that You would just prepare our hearts to receive it. Give us eyes that see it and ears that hear it. Father God, that we'd just be totally ready. Father God, that this place would just be ripe for Your Word. Father God, to come and do awesome things here today. And we just come expecting, because we come in the mighty name of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Talking about holding on to hope. I heard a story that will probably get me in trouble, and therefore I'm even more tempted to tell it. There was a recruit, wanted to be a police officer, he made it to his final exam. Part of the exam was oral, and you had to do it in front of the other students, put pressure on you, see how you'd handle pressure. And the sergeant yelled at him, and he said, you have to arrest your own mother-in-law. He said, what are you going to do? And without hesitation, the recruit just raised his hand, and he said, call for backup. I love that. (laughs) Call for backup. Holding on to hope. You know what? In the beginning of something, it's always exciting. Anytime you're starting something new, there's that freshness to it. There's that excitement. And how many of you all know the end of something is really rewarding? And it's, it's always almost a relief also, isn't it? When you finally finish something. And so neither one of those spots are the tests in our life. It's not the beginning, and it's certainly not the end. But rather, it's all the way through the middle that we have the struggles in life. See, the middle is messy. The middle is the part that we're embarrassed about and the part that we wish would just go away. When God gives us a promise, or gives us a dream, He always shows us the end. He always shows us the completed project. But what He doesn't show us is the mess in the middle. A friend I have that I graduated from high school with, he bought his first home, and they decided they were going to remodel the bathroom. It had an old, old shower in it. It was way outdated, and they thought, well, you know, we're going to start to improve the house. It would be nicer for us. It would be worth more money when we sell it. And so they ripped that shower out of there, thinking, oh, this project, he took off a week, I'll be done before the week's out. He pulls out the shower and realizes that the thing's been leaking for who knows how long, and the entire floor is rotted out. Some of you are laughing because you've probably had this happen to you or something similar. And so he thinks, all right, you know, we can do this. We're going to have to rip all the floor out. They go to ripping out the floor and get to looking at the plumbing. And it all needs replaced. Not just in the bathroom, but all the way through the house. And so what was going to take just a few days, now it's probably going to take a few weeks, mind you. And so, listen, and what did did he think? If I had known what it was going to look like when I pulled out that shower, I would have never even started. And that's the way it is in our lives. That's the way it is in our walk with God. Oftentimes we have something we think is going to be awesome, it's going to be great, because we see the end. But we don't see all the mess that's going to be in the middle. How many of you all have lived with home improvement projects? (laughs) You told everybody what you are going to do. I've heard you guys, you didn't just tell, you bragged. (laughs) You boasted. And then you got into it. And it turned out to be three times what you thought it was going to be. 
You bragged about it before, but what's going on? Do you want anybody at your house? Do you even want to talk about it after a while? And if you do, you're complaining. But when it's all said and done, do you want people to see what you did? Is it still just as good as it at the end as what it would have been? And are you still glad you pressed on through? See, in the middle is where your faith is being tested of whether you hold on to your hope to still receive the reward of the end. And God didn't tell you everything because you wouldn't have stepped out in faith had you known how hard it would be. But He also trusted you with the dream because He knew you could handle it. Did you all hear that? You think in the middle when it's so messy and hard, it's embarrassing, even you don't want anybody to see your mess, you don't want to talk about your mess unless you're complaining about your mess. You think this is terrible, and you think oftentimes this will never be over. Some of you all I know, you have felt like you had home improvement projects that would never end. And think about it in your own life. The spiritual messes, the spiritual battles, sometimes they feel like they'll never end, don't they? Maybe you're in that spot right now where you're kind of in limbo. How many of y'all remember that? You always knew at the skating rink when you were going to do the limbo because what did they do? They turned on the song. So you're standing there, all of a sudden you hear... It's supposed to be so happy. I tell you what, you all might think the limbo is happy, but I think it hurts. You know, I'm only good while you can go under front ways, you know. When you start to go back ways and then do those splits, you might as well just call the ambulance for me because I'm going out of here in a stretcher. Limbo is not as fun as the song makes it out to be, is it? And maybe you feel like your life is in limbo right now. It's those places where things are uncertain. feels like it will never end. feels like it will never have closure. And you feel like everything's out of control. But God's here to say today, when your life feels out of control, He's still the God who's totally in control. God knows how to get us through the places of limbo in our lives where we don't see how it's going to end well. We don't see how it could end right. We don't see how God could work it together for good. But He always does. God always finishes the projects that He starts. Amen? God, if He gets us started in something, He's going to complete it. Amen, church. God is in control, and He's going to bring a conclusion to your mess. Look in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. This is our main text this morning. He says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Notice this, that anchor is both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil We have this anchor for the soul. What is it? It's our hope. And that word short and steadfast, those words mean this, that that anchor will hold no matter what happens to you. If you will hold on to hope, hope will hang on to you. Did you hear that? And some of you all know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been out on a boat, I'm telling you, even on a still calm lake, if you don't put down the anchor, you're going to start to move. But what about when a storm hits or when somebody goes by and causes a wake and you don't have an anchor down? See, we need to learn to put down our anchor and keep it there. Amen? Don't pull your anchor up because there's waves hitting your boat. That's the enemy trying to trick you. Are you hearing me this morning? The last place you want to pull up the anchor is when the waves start to hit and the storm strikes. But that's exactly when the enemy wants to try to scare you into pulling up your anchor of hope. But it's in that moment that you've got to dig in and keep your anchor down. Amen? He wants to scare you into pulling it up. He wants to intimidate you. But remember, your anchor is sure and steadfast. And notice this, it enters into the presence behind the veil. You know, there's that time when the storm hits and like Mick said, maybe you want to even be angry at God. You want to run from God. But when the storm hits, it's time to run to God. It's time to get behind the veil. It's time to get into the presence. It's time to praise Him in the middle of the storm. Amen. That is the time we get into the presence and we press on in. And listen, the enemy's going to strike because he's trying to get you to give up your hope. Because he knows if you'll pull up that anchor, he can begin to blow you around and set you off course. 
And trust me, He will. In 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul said, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again. In other words, I kept trying. I kept trying. I was in limbo about this. But notice this. But Satan hindered us. That word hindered means to cut off. It means to block the way. A while back, Sarah and I were driving down Interstate 79. And we were getting ready to get off in Weston on Exit 99. And many of you all know that it's one of those exits where people are coming on while trying to get off. It's a wonderful ingenious design they have there. (laughs) Nothing could go wrong with that, right? And we were just talking about, I was just saying, Sarah, I've got these, when we have these ideas, these things we've been trying to do. I said, but it feels like the enemy's trying to stop us. I said, it feels like he's trying to block us. And you know what? We went to pull off of exit 99. And when you know, somebody pulled up in a car and I would slow down and they'd slow down. I'd speed up and they sped up. And you know what? I had to totally miss my exit, drive on down to the southwestern exit 96, turn around and come back. And trust me, I was praying on the way back up. God let me off my exit. But God was illustrating for me the fact that Satan will try to block what you're doing for him. He will try to hinder you. And listen, it comes from the Greek word. It means it was talking about runners and Greek races. What it means when they hindered, it means they'd come up beside you and they would elbow you with everything they had to try to put you out of the race. Has the enemy elbowed anybody here? Has he taken your wind away? Has He hit you with everything He has and tried to block you and try to stop you from entering into your destiny and the plan that God has for you? Notice Isaiah 50 verse 7. What do we need to do? He says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. I will not be ashamed. Notice this. Therefore I have set my face, and this has been my Scripture lately, like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. I've set my face like a flint. You as a flint, it's, it's, it's harder than granite. In other words, as hard as the enemy hit me, I'm coming back harder. Did you hear that? The enemy tried his best, and his best wasn't good enough. Listen, the enemy tried his best to stop me. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The enemy tried his best to stop me, but all he did was make me unstoppable. Amen. Amen. When the devil attacked Job, did he think Job would fall? Oh yeah. But Job didn't fall. He came back double. Amen. Amen. Read the end of the book. I'm going to talk to somebody today. I'm going to have one person that gets this message. But by golly, I'm talking to you today anyways. And we're going to have a conversation. Because I've been going through it too. And so we're going to do this thing now together. We're going to set our face like a flint. We're going to get a backbone of steel. A never say die attitude. I will not quit. I cannot quit. Stop is not an option. Listen, and you may be in the midst of the storm and somebody saying, yeah, but you're still going through all these troubles. I may still be here in the middle of the storm, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to get there. Hallelujah. You may still be here, but it doesn't mean you're not going to get there. There is on the horizon. There is a new horizon. And we're going to press toward the mark. Last week, I had to have to go make a new key for my home. And I handed them the key and you know, they took the key off that was supposed to be like mine. You know, it had already pretty much looked like mine. And to the naked eye, I would think, why don't you just hand me the key? But there's fine grinding that must take place. There's a refining process to get that thing exact. And I don't know about you, but I've realized that at the beginning of any dream, any vision, anything I'm trying to work on, I already think I'm ready. And I'm thinking this should just happen right now. And it should be easy because I look ready to me. But you know what? When he sticks that thing in the machine with the right code, that code shows that machine that that key is not ready at all. And in the middle of that storm, you know what begins to happen? <laughs> all of a sudden, you begin to get grounded on. Anybody here been getting grinded on a little bit? You're getting cut on a little bit. You're getting shaved off. All those rough edges are getting shaved off. You're getting pushed on, pried on, tried on. The enemy's testing you. The fire is up hot and he's trying you and he's testing you. And all the while you're like, God, get me out of this machine. I can't take it anymore. I've been ground. I'm going to be powder if you don't stop. But finally, when you come out, listen, 
You haven't gotten there yet, but you're going to. And you don't understand why all the grinding right now, but you will when you get there. Because finally, God brings you to your door. Your door isn't my door. Did you hear that? God has a specific door for you that only your key will unlock. And you didn't understand it at that moment, but He brings you up to your door, and all of a sudden, everything in your life clicks. Did you hear that? Did anything in Joseph's life make sense? He was betrayed by his brother, sold as a slave, betrayed by his owner, lied about, thrown into prison. He's betrayed there as well. 13 years of nothing. And then in one day, he's Pharaoh's right-hand man. What happened? All the while, God was following his key. Did you hear that? And then one day, he met his door, and he heard click. And the door went open, and everything changed. Some of you are about ready to hear click. The grinding won't last forever. You've been getting ground on, beat on, but one day you're going to walk on through that door. But listen, if he had pulled out the key too soon, it wouldn't have been ready. And he had to lower that thing into that machine. How many of you all to be lowered means to be humbled? And there's something about trusting God in the process. i got to quit trying to do it my way, trying to do it the way I thought it would be, and trust His way. I've got to get lowered. And so the way we hold on to hope, the first thing we must do is we've got to get lower. Pastor, I didn't think you were going to go there. You were making me feel good. Listen, if you want a triumphant life, this is what will make you feel good. It's the man and the woman on their face before God that walks in freedom. Did you hear that? I know that in America there aren't too many sermons on humility, but I've noticed that God keeps bringing me right back to it all the time. Because guess what? There may not be many sermons about it, but apparently I need to hear it. And maybe it's why He has me keep saying it, because no one else seems to be. Listen, let's see Scriptures now. I want to get into these Scriptures. This is good. Turn to your neighbor and say, this would be good even if I don't like it. Psalm 131. This psalm always stomps my toes. He says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. In other words, I'm not walking in pride and conceit. How does He know this? Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor things too profound for me. In other words, He's saying, I'm not trying to figure out this mess. I'm not trying to make sense of my life. Can anybody else here say... Amen to this psalm as if you do it all the time. Or are you like me sometimes? You're just the opposite. You're concerning yourself with great matters and trying to figure out things too profound for you. And we don't realize it, but you know what that is? Pride, pride, pride. It's me trying to do God's job for Him. It's me thinking I need to figure it out because He needs my help, of course. He's always needing my advice, right? Huh. Let's learn to trust God with what we're going through. God, I don't understand this. Guess what? We need to learn to trust Him anyways. God, I may not like this, but I love You. How, how would it be if the church would come to a place where we can say, God, I don't understand any of this, I don't like any of this, but I trust You and I love You anyways. Did you hear that? There should be more amens over that. But I think some of you are getting ground in the grinder right now with these Scriptures. You know what? I'm there too. Notice verse 2. He says, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. I've kept my soul quiet like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. This reminds me of when my youngest son was born. That boy had a scream that could wake the dead. He would get colicky and he would scream out when he was in hunger or pain. And I mean, it, it was blood curdling. And you just wanted it to stop. He sounded like he was going to die. It, would, it scared a new parent half to death, trust me. But when he would get weaned, it's like he would go from this total terror and scream to absolute peaceful sleep. And you look in his face and he was at total rest. The only one that can calm us in the midst of the storm is God Almighty. He is the anchor that goes behind the veil into the presence. 
And there's something about the peace of God that, listen, it surpasses our understanding. It gives us peace when we can't figure things out, when we don't understand, and we would wish it all away. It's peace that keeps us within the veil. Psalm 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And that word broken, listen, it doesn't just mean that your situation has broken you and you're crying, you're weeping, you're upset, but it also means contrite. Have you ever noticed that you come to these places in your life where the situation has broken you, and yes, you're upset, but also you come to the place where you say, God, I can't do this anymore. God, you have to handle this. You know what that is? That's full brokenness. And God allowed the grinding to get you to the place of brokenness because He can only work with a broken vessel. He can't fix the vessel that thinks it's okay the way it is. He has to let you see that you're broken. He says, and save such as have a contrite spirit. The word contrite means to be crushed. It means to be discouraged, but it also means to be meek. To be meek means that I'm trusting God with everything that I am. And listen, if you're in a situation in your life you can't explain, you don't understand, you want to get rid of, you know what? You're in good company. So is the Apostle Paul. Romans 11.33 says this, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. I love this phrase. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. If the man who wrote a third of the New Testament didn't understand it all, said his ways are past finding out, you know what, I'm not going to figure it out either. Amen? And so we come to a place where we say, I don't have it figured out, I don't understand it all, but I know the one who does. Amen? I don't have any control of this, but I know the one who does. I don't have any understanding of this. It doesn't make sense. I didn't want it. But I know the One who does. And I know that He works all things, good and bad, together for those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose. So if your life doesn't make sense, you just joined a great big club. And I'd like to say welcome today. Amen. Hallelujah. You're not alone. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Why? So He can leave you there? No. That He may what? Exalt you in due time. There is a right time when God is going to say you are ready for the promotion. You are ready to move on to that relationship you've been praying for. You're going to move on into that situation that you've been waiting on. He says there is a time. And what it also means is that your troubles have an expiration date. They will not last forever. There will come a time where God says, remember He says to the devil, you can only go this far with Job. There's an expiration date to your trouble. Hallelujah. And there's an arrival date for your destiny and your blessing. But he says, humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at just the right time, casting all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. And there it is, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trial, we cast our cares upon Him. We don't worry ourselves with what only God can fix. We don't try to figure out what only He can understand, but we place it in His hands. And listen, you may be tempted to pick it back up on your own, but here I am saying today, if you've picked it up, throw it back. Amen. If the enemy tries to get you to pull up your anchor of hope, let it back down today. Hold on to your hope. Humble yourselves. Get lower. And listen, He's about ready to lift you up. It is coming. And it's coming soon. Sometimes when you want to run away, that's the time to press in. I remember David... He's out, he's out running in the wilderness. He's been anointed king, but he's anything but king. The king is trying to kill him. And many times he would run to God, and that's where so many of the Psalms came from. They didn't come in the great high times of his life. They came in the valleys of his life. They came in the difficulties. Listen, in your difficult season and in the valley, God has a song for you. He has a psalm for you. He has a word for you to, to declare over your life. And listen, sometimes he would have to get on to himself. Some of us are waiting for the pastor to stir us up or somebody else to get us going. Sometimes the only person that can stir you up is you. 
Did you hear that? Quit looking for somebody else to do what God's already equipped you to do. And David would say, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you so disquieted within me? He'd go and say, I will yet hope in God, the help of my countenance. And those the one that gets a smile back on my face. And my God. There is a time for us to stir our stuff up to press on in. Daniel prayed, nothing happens. You know what he did? He decided, I guess it's time for a fast. It wasn't for a day or two days. It went on for 21 days. But you know what? He didn't stop. He kept pressing in. And finally an angel broke through. And he declared to him the warfare where the enemy had been trying to block his blessing. But Daniel pressed on in, would not stop until he received what God had for him. If you want to hold on to your hope, get lower. But number two, get closer. Get close to God. God says, draw near unto me, and I'll draw near unto you. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. We're about ready to preach a little bit. Abraham, at the age of 75, was promised a son. Not only a son, but a nation. Not just any nation, but a nation that would be as numbered as the stars in the sky the sand on the seashore. He said it will be uncountable. He said not only that, but through you every nation on the earth will be blessed. He gave him this promise as an old man. But you know what? The promise came to pass. But you know what? There was a storm in the middle. I bet you he thought it would be next year. But you know what? 25 years went by. If it looked impossible when he was 75, how do you think he felt at 100? In the natural, it did not look possible, did it? How do you keep hope when things look hopeless? And yet that's what he found. That's what happened in his life. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 4.17. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed. Whom he believed, God. He gives life to the dead. And notice this phrase. And he calls those saints which do not exist as though they already did. Do you know that God calls Jesus, He called Jesus the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It hadn't happened yet, but in God's eyes, there is no time, there is no distance. What will be is just as much as already is. And so if God said it and it hasn't happened, that means nothing. Because God said it and He can't lie. Did you hear that? He sees those things that are not as if they already were. You know when faith is happening in your life, i got to say this, it's when what you see in your heart is more real to you than what you see with your eyes. It's when that dream, that promise that you believe, you believe it more than what you see or feel around you. And listen, you know what happens? Your face gets set like a flint. It hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen It hasn't materialized, but I know it's going to happen because my God said it, and my God cannot lie. Amen. Notice this next phrase. Some of you need to take this word home with you. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. What does that mean? It means this, when everything in his situation looked hopeless, he held on to hope. When it looked impossible, he believed the God with whom all things are possible. When all of his circumstances screamed, give up, move on, he anchored down and held on. And when he held on to the hope, when everything looked hopeless, hopeless held on to him and it brought him through. Now that is a good word, by the way. Some of you may not be ready for this. Maybe you haven't been in hopelessness. But somebody here has. There's somebody in the house that's hit a hopeless situation. That's hit a spot where everything looks impossible. I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to the person who everything looks like it will never work out. It can never work out. That person will never repent. That situation will never turn around. That marriage will never heal. That child will never come home and get saved. I'm talking to somebody. Looks like those finances will never get straightened out. I'm going to be broke and death the rest of my life. So I'm going to be listening. Nobody's going to like me. I'm going to have all these bad relationships. You keep believing this. Listen, God is saying that the hopeless thing, He's about ready to break loose on. He's going to...
gonna bust it wide open. And everybody's gonna look and say, what just happened? And you're gonna say, I stayed anchored. You didn't see it, but I saw it. You didn't believe it, but I believed it. You didn't see it coming, but I saw it coming all along. Hallelujah. You know what? Nobody else told me about it. Nobody else encouraged me, but I encouraged myself. I told myself. Hallelujah. Everybody else abandoned you. They left you. They put you down. They discouraged you, but you stood for what you believed in. And therefore, so that He became the Father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And notice this verse 19, not being weak in faith. I underline this phrase, He did not consider. In other words, His circumstances did not enter His calculations. When anything contradicted what God said, you know what he did? That's a lie. Did you hear that? The doctor's report says, I'll never get well. Delete. Did you hear that? The enemy says, you don't have what it takes. Delete. The enemy says, you've already messed this up too much. You've already forfeited your destiny. Delete. He's nothing but a liar. But our God's word is nothing but true. He did not consider, notice this, He did not consider His own body already dead. In other words, He was past the point of procreating since He was about what? By now a hundred years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's almost a hundred, she's ninety years old. You feel like your ship has sailed. But God's saying, it's just about ready to come in. Amen. When everything looks like it's going to work out, that's probably when it won't. God shows up at the point where you would have given up. And He does it where it looks impossible. That way you know it's Him. Did you hear that? I know we want it when it's easy. But we're not ready for that. we still got some grinding that needs done. You know what the waiting? Listen, it's not so much about the dream coming to pass. You know what it's about? It's about the person you're going to be by the time you get there. You're going to be stronger, wiser, and much more stable. It's who you're going to be. It's not about the what. But what God's going to look at is He's going to to see the transformation that happened in you and how you came to the other end. And yes, He's excited about the coming of the dream, but what He's most excited about is what just happened in you and who you are now. I'm talking to somebody. I don't know. It may have just been for one person there. But trust me, God is excited about what's going on in you even more than what's happening through you. But notice what he did, verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. (sighs) Look at this phrase. But was strengthened. And notice he kept getting closer to God in his faith. And what was he doing the whole time? While nothing was happening, everything looked impossible, what did he keep doing? Giving glory to God. Did you hear that? Do you realize how powerful the declaration, I'll praise you in this storm is? There's a world of people out there that praise God when things go right. But the people with breakthrough, the real believers are the folks that hang on, praise Him, trust Him in the midst of the storm, and they keep giving the glory to God no matter what. That's a good word, by the way. And I want you to notice verse 21, and being fully convinced. Remember something, though. Did Abraham get to the place of being fully convinced overnight? I don't want you to forget that a few years into this, his wife convinced him to lie down with Hagar. And they produced an Ishmael. You know what? Right now you might beat yourself up because you're saying, well, Pastor, I've got some doubts. 
you know what that means? You're in process. It took, it took Abraham 25 years to come to the place where he said, you know what, I don't care what happens. God's word's coming to pass. Did you hear? Some of y'all don't like what I just said, but read the rest of your Bible. Abraham, before he got to full faith, had a lot of doubt and even had disobedience in his life. Don't beat yourself up for where you're not yet. You're on your way. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor say, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. Praise God. Hallelujah. God cannot lie, therefore you cannot lose. What God has shown you in your heart is bigger than what you see with your eyes. And what you believe in your heart is bigger than what's happening to you. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange. And I don't think it's unusual concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. You know what the devil tried to make you think? That you're all alone. And this is unusual. And yet other people have problems, but your problems are unusual. You know what he says? It's nothing strange or unusual. But what does he say? He says as though some strange thing happened to you. The enemy wants us to get discouraged, get scared, and flee. Some of you folks may remember this. You'd be listening to the radio or back in analog TV. You'd be sitting there watching TV, and all of a sudden what happened? Beep! And you get the little lines going up and down the screen, and you know what they would say? This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. And then what would they say next? This is only a test. In other words, don't be alarmed. It's just a test. And what God is saying is don't be alarmed. God hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't forgotten about you. It's only right. a test. Amen. Amen. It has nothing to do with whether He's going to fulfill your promise. All the enemy can do is try to convince you that God abandoned you. But he can't make it true. It's only a test. Did somebody hear that? The next time you're in the middle of the trial, just hear, Beep! This is only a test. Listen, the only power the enemy can ever get over you is the lie that you believe. If you'll stay anchored to hope and not get hooked up to his lie, then you will stay behind the veil. Did somebody hear that? And somebody says, well, you don't understand how rough it is. The devil's got power, Pastor. Yeah, he's got power. But I'm here to say today, you've got God's power. And there's no way for me to differentiate how much greater our God is than Him. He's just a created being. He's already been defeated. And His days are numbered. And even He knows that. That was a good word. I want to read a couple more scriptures here this morning. I want to read a passage we all know because I sense it's what we need to hear. Psalm 23, in verse 4. Yea, though. Have you thought about those two words? Even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm walking through the darkest place in my life and it looks like I'm not going to make it. Even there, what does he say? I will fear no evil. Greater is he that is for me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. In all things, I am more than a conqueror through him that loves me. My God's love His mercy is new every morning. And it doesn't matter what the enemy is throwing against me. I know that my God is for me. And listen to this. If God be for me, who can be against me? Notice the next phrase. For you are with me. In other words, I have my anchor held within the veil. I know that you've got me, God. I know that you've got this situation. Your rod and your staff, they're what are comforting me. Notice this. You are preparing. You are arranging. You are putting in order a table for me right in the presence of my enemies. I love in the book of Esther, there was a man named Haman who wanted to kill all the Jews. He plotted. He schemed. 
Esther had an uncle named Mordecai. He hated Mordecai more than anyone because Mordecai wouldn't bow to him and honor him. Mordecai would only worship his God. And it made Haman so mad. And so he built gallows for him that were very tall and he was ready to destroy him. But listen, the king found out what kind of man Mordecai was, decided to honor him. He brings in Haman and he says to Haman, how do I, how do I honor a man that's protected the king? And so Mordecai said, well, you put him on your finest horse, put your finest robe on him, parade him through the city. And you know what the king said? Guess what, Haman? Go get Mordecai because today I'm going to honor him. He prepared a table before him. He set it up right in the midst of his enemies. I want you to hear something. Then Esther took Haman to a dinner. A prepared feast with the king, her, and Haman, her enemy. And right there in the presence of her enemy, she said, this man is trying to kill your wife and all of her relatives, all of her people, the Jews. And right there... Haman was dealt with, and listen, the gallows that he built for Mordecai, he hung on in front of the whole city. That's a good word, by the way. God is about ready to take your situation and turn it around like you could not even believe. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. There is an anointing. Listen, I heard a preacher say this. Listen, you know you're anointed when everybody leaves you and everybody forsakes you and you get more done with less than you got done before. Did you hear that? Hallelujah. There's been times I thought I was done, but I was just getting started. And I had to find out the greater was He that was in me than He was in the world. And what I thought I needed, I didn't have to have because the power and the presence of God will do what nobody else could ever do for me. Hallelujah. There's a presence here. Somebody, they think they know you. They don't know you yet because they haven't seen God's potential in you. They think they got you figured out. They don't know nothing. Hallelujah. They think they can define you, but only your Creator can say who you are. Hallelujah. And I'd love to look back and say, you thought you had me defined, but only my Creator knew who I was. Hallelujah. My cup runs it over. He says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That word follow me is to pursue, chase, and run down. Not just on the good days, not just on your best days, but all the days of your life. On the worst day, in the worst storm, in the darkest valley of the shadow of death, the goodness and mercy of God is chasing you down, pursuing you, and running after you. And He says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can I read that first verse one more time? Hebrews 6.19 This hope. By the way, the word hope doesn't mean I'm wishing. It means I know. The word hope means being confident that good is coming. Did you hear that? It means being confident that good is coming. This hope. Why is good coming? Because our God is good. Did you hear that? And He's in control. He says this hope we have is an anchor of our soul. Both sure and steadfast. It's immovable. And which enters the presence of God behind the veil. I say to you today as our worship team comes forward, hang on to your hope. And hope will hang on to you. Keep your anchor down and don't pull it up. And God will keep you. I've got to say one more thing. In my house there's a thermostat. And during the summertime, now my wife, she doesn't want it cold. But I could turn it down to like 65 degrees or whatever, and it would be great. The only thing that really keeps me from it, besides the fact that she would hate it, is that I don't want to pay for it. (laughs) I've got this thermostat, but it's going to cost me something. But how many of you have ever went on vacation or went into a motel room, and you saw that thermostat, and even though you only kept your house at such and such temperature, you just crank on that thing. Why do you do that? 
Because it's already... Has Jesus already paid for it all? Has He already paid for your sin? For your salvation? For your forgiveness? For your victory? For your healing? For your peace? For your joy? Are you hearing me this morning? It's already been paid for. And you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm on vacation, if it's 120 degrees outside. It's 60 in my room. It may be 5 degrees outside, but it's 85 on the inside. You know what I'm talking about. And the enemy's trying to tell you, he's trying to get the circumstances in your life on the inside. But what you need to do is set the thermostat of your hope where you want it to be. Did you hear that? And where God says it should be. And you know what? The enemy may turn up the fire in your life. It may be 120 degrees on the outside. He may be trying to grind you to pieces, but on the inside, you can be a cool 65. Hallelujah. The enemy may be trying to cause you to go through the worst winter of your life. It may be 50 below zero, but on the inside, it can be 90 degrees if you want it. It's all on how you set your thermostat of hope. And what you decide on the inside, it's an anchor that holds you within the veil. And it doesn't matter what enemy thrown against you, you hope and you hang on to that hope. And you have hope even when it looks hopeless because you know that your God cannot lie and therefore you cannot lose this. It's only a matter of time. Your trial has an expiration date. And at the end of that, your blessing is on its way, church. Your victory is on its way because it's already been paid for. It's already been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it will not be denied. Anybody here going to set their face like a flint? That you're not going to quit. You're not going to give up. You're going to see this through. Am I talking to at least one person here today that says, I will not quit. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws against me. I'm going to get to the end of this and I'm going to receive God's best for my life. I am holding on to hope. I'm anchored to it. I'm not giving up. Church, let's stand this morning. Set the thermostat of your hope today to the promises and the Word of God. And don't let go. Do not let go no matter what happens. This is only a test. And your test will end soon. And trust me, you don't want to miss on what's the other side. Don't leave your house of your life in permanent disarray because you got struggled with the process of the refining. Let God finish the work that God started. So everybody can see the new house, the new work, what God has done in you. These altars are open for church to come forward to grab a hold of your hope in God, to set that thermostat of faith and watch what God does. Today's a good day. Today's the day where you decide, I don't care what happens to me, I'm going to get God's best for me. And I will not be denied. In Jesus' name, amen.